Welcome back to Unicorn Anatomy, my fellow believers. In today's lesson... Don't learn off randoms. Revise with BBC Bite Size. All core subjects, all levels, all in one place. In today... And it's exam board approved. Bite Size! Be aware you're in bear country. It's just broken down on us. Whoa. Top of the world. That's where we're going. <laughs> <laughs> the guys are definitely lost. We're gonna die. We're all gonna die. Spectacular. I'm now in race mode. Race Across the World continues Wednesday at 9 on BBC One and iPlayer. Welcome to Sunday Morning on BBC One. Tony here with you live at 9 o'clock. Hope you remember the clocks went forward. Now, always a great start to the day. Sunday with Laura Kunzberg. This morning, we'll talk about cash. The money in your pockets, the money the government has got to spend, and when, as a country, we can be confident there'll be a bit more to go around. Interest rates up. Council tax up. Inflation, you guessed it, that's going up too. We've seen signs of inflation really peaking now, but of course it's far too high. The opposite to what the Prime Minister claims to you. We're halving inflation by paying 50% of people's energy bills and freezing fuel duty. Not yet, he's not. There's price pressure on everyone just as the extent of Sunak and Starmer's income is revealed. Mega wealth for one, doing rather well for the other one, as official figures for the first time reveal very different numbers. More than two million people using food banks just to get by. A lot of the time it means either starving or getting something to eat. So we have one big question this morning. When will everyone start to feel better off? This man does the sums that tell the government how much cash they have, but why do they sometimes get it wrong? We'll ask the boss of the Independent Office for Budget Responsibility, Richard Hughes. It's Michael Gove's job to make sure the chance of a good life is spread fairly across the land, but can he level up when living standards are going down? Labour's Lucy Powell has big plans for the BBC, but what's the problem that she's trying to fix? And remember this act of courage. Marina of Zanikova famously interrupted live TV in Russia to protest against the war in Ukraine. She'll tell us about her astonishing escape. I was almost screaming, thinking and saying, it's better for me to go back to Russia, go to prison. But my daughter was saying, get up, let's go, we have to cross the border. More of her amazing story in about half an hour. And welcome to my amazing panel this morning. Andy Haldane, one of the best economic brains in the country, who spent many years as Bank of England top brass. Christiana Figueres, who was the United Nations top climate chief. And the John Lewis boss turned conservative mayor of the West Midlands is here, Andy Street. Morning, morning, and I promise you we will be things to bring you things to be cheerful about as well as some grim news. But let's see what is getting people going this morning. Let's go straight to the front pages. A bit of a mixed bag today. The front of the Sunday Times has a story that says children as young as eight are being strip searched. The Observer has a story that's caused some red faces in the Tory parties, a sting where they've seen MPs being offered £10,000 a day to work for a fake company. But the tabloids again a mixed bag. The front page of the Mail on Sunday in Scotland talking about the potential new First Minister, Kate Forbes, that announcement coming tomorrow. And the Sunday Express mentioning something we'll be talking about with Michael Gove in a few minutes, the government's promised blitz on antisocial behaviour. But let's first of all talk with our panel about the big picture of what's going on in the country. We saw inflation going up again this week by surprise, interest rates going up again. Andy, is it going to come down as the Bank of England and the government really hopes by the end of the year? Yes. I think that's pretty nailed on, Laura. Morning, by the way. Uh, as the effects of last year's energy price rises fall out, and energy prices have fallen since, we'll see inflation falling pretty rapidly 
in the next month or so, I think. But by how much? So the bank and the government says maybe back down all the way nearly to 1% to 3%. That's not out of the question, I would say. And that will mean into the second half of the year, Laura, I think we will see things be a little bit better mm -hmm. for the average household after a horrible income squeeze over the last 18 months or so. Well, one of the things about this is how people, the difference between what's on spreadsheets and the difference to how mm. people feel. I mean, Andy, you represent you know, millions of people in the West Midlands. Does the economy feel like it's working for the people that you represent there? Yeah, good morning, Chip. Good morning. Yeah, the answer is it's a mixed picture, actually. If you're right at the bottom of the income levels, facing spending a lot of money on heating and on uh, food, it's really tough. We can see that. But what we also see in our economy, after a big adjustment after COVID, we were doing very well, some of our traditional sectors very hard, like manufacturing, we're seeing incredible growth in some of the new areas. Technology, the green economy, really good. And actually construction and the professional services also coming back strongly. So it's a mixed picture is the truth. You have been a bit cross though about how the government has tried to spread some of the country's wealth such as it is. And you accuse the government's levelling up plan of being like asking people like you to go to Whitehall with a begging bowl. And there's been a decisive response to that in the last uh, couple of weeks, which I'm sure you might even talk to Michael about, actually, in the devolution deal that's been struck for us and for Greater Manchester, where we end the begging bowl, really. And what we move to is trusting regions with a big sum of money, a single pot, as it's been called, mm -hmm. and we take the decisions locally. So it is a decisive change in direction. So have you now got all the power that you want? We never have all that we want. <laughs> but we've certainly got, I, I would say, actually, the boot in the sense is on the other foot now. We've got to demonstrate what we're going to do with it to show that trust is well placed. Okay, interesting. One of the things you mentioned there um, is food inflation. Now, Christiana, this is absolutely one of the things that you have looked at. Is food always going to be expensive as we carry on with things as they are? That very much depends on how we're producing food. So let's look a little bit under the hood. Yesterday, I spent some time with mothers here in the UK who are hunger striking, demonstrating in front of parliament because one in four mothers in the UK, one of the richest countries in the world, have to choose between feeding themselves and feeding their children. You know which choice they're making. One in 10 children globally do not have enough food. Why? For many reasons, but there are two global reasons behind this. First, the absolutely outrageous prices of fossil fuels mm -hmm. due to the politicization of fossil fuels. And secondly, the decreasing crop yields that are also due to extreme weather events because of the burning of fossil fuels. So two different problems, mm -hmm. same root cause, fossil fuels. Therefore, we have to understand that moving away from fossil fuels over to clean energy and technology actually is a measure to protect the most vulnerable. Okay, well later on we'll ask you also to give some solutions to that problem, but, but all three of you, thank you very much for your thoughts just now, because this morning we are trying to work out when most people can expect to feel a bit better off after years of hard times for many. In a second we'll talk to Michael Gove, but one of the difficult things about all of this is that the crystal ball is a bit wonky when it comes to predicting what might happen. Now the Office for Budget Responsibility was set up in 2010. It's independent and every six months it tells the government and all of us what is going to happen to the economy, how much it will grow, how much it will shrink and how much money the government has to play with. Now it's important because they check the government sums for all of us. But the reality is their forecasts, just like the weather ones, sometimes turn out to be wrong. Take a look at these. In March, they said the rate prices would increase would peak at 8.7%. Actually, look at it go up to 11.1%. Now it's 104 They also predicted that the government would borrow £177 billion last year. But in the end, actually, it was £99 billion. Now that gave ministers, hypothetically, a lot more cash to play with. And the OBR told us before that right now we would be in recession, except we're not, although only just. So if the numbers slide all over the place like that, how can we know as a country when we will start to feel a bit better off? I asked the boss of the OBR, Richard Hughes, why they often get it a bit wrong. So all forecasts in the end turn out to be wrong. Every forecast has an error. Even weather forecasters don't get the exact rainfall right on a given week or the exact temperature on a given day. And I think in particular in the UK, we are forecasting in an incredibly volatile environment like every country is at the moment because 
energy prices have been rising fivefold and then falling back by a half in the course of the last year or so. Interest rates have trebled uh, over the course of the last year. So it's a very volatile environment in which to be forecasting. Do you have too much influence over politicians making decisions? I think uh, politicians always pay, base their decisions on a forecast from somebody. It used to be these forecasts were done inside the Treasury. In the UK, we made a decision to outsource those to the OBR. We did that 13 years ago. Um, and I think our forecasting record turns out to be slightly better than the forecasting record of the, of the Treasury when it was doing the forecasts back before 2010. We have lower forecast errors and also less biased forecasts than the Treasury used to produce. But how confident are you inflation's actually going to fall to less than 3%? I think there's a huge amount of uncertainty around the outlook for inflation, but it is the case that of the double digit inflation that we're seeing at the moment, around half of that is coming from energy prices and food prices. And when you look ahead, there are a number of factors which ought to bring those prices down over the remainder of the year. Do you think we'll ever see food prices coming down? Because the level of some things right now is astronomical compared to where they were even a few months ago. Some of them may do, but you're right that our fundamental challenge as a country is that we are a net importer of food, we are a net importer of energy, and the prices of the things which we consume have been rising at twice the pace of the prices of the things which we produce. And that just means that as a country, we are, we are poorer, we are worse off, because our wages can't keep pace with the prices of the things like energy, like food, which are set in global markets and have been rising a lot faster than the prices of the things which we produce. And how would you describe the overall state of the economy? I think we're seeing clearly the biggest squeeze on living standards we face in this country on record. But we do expect as we get past this year and we go into the next three or four years that real income starts to recover. But it's still the case that um, people's real spending power doesn't get back to the level it was before the pandemic, even after five years, even by the time we get to the late 2020s. That's so grim, though. You're saying it might be another five or even six years until people start feeling better off again. That's right, based on our latest forecast, and it's partly because UK growth has been held back by a range of supply constraints on some of the key drivers of growth. We've lost around 500,000 people from the labour force. We've seen stagnant investment since 2016. And also our productivity has slowed dramatically since the financial crisis, not really recovered. How much stronger would the economy be if we'd stayed in the EU? We think that in the long run, it reduces our overall output by around 4% compared to had we remained in the EU. How would you describe 4% though? Would that be the equivalent of another conflict or a smaller pandemic? Uh, I struggle to put it in any kind of sensible, uh, sensible context. I mean, it is, it's, it's a shock to the UK economy of, of, of the order of magnitude of the sorts of other shocks that we've seen from the pandemic, from the energy crisis. Those have also had percentage point impacts on the level of output in, in five, 10 years time. Now, I want to ask you about one huge long term issue. You've forecast if nothing's done to halt climate change, our debt to GDP ratio might rise to 289 percent of GDP by the end of the century. Now, that seems hard to imagine. What would that feel like? So that would be the level of, of debt that we had basically at the end of the Second World War. So on a sort of cataclysm of that stage and consequences for the economy and consequences for the government finances on that on, on that on, of that of that sort of magnitude. So a, a lot of our economic model would cease to work. Um, you know, a lot of our infrastructure would end up being underwater or unusable. Um, we would have housing which would be close to floodplains, which would be uh, you know, would be would be underwater. So the, the, the damage to the economy comes from the fact that the infrastructure that you've got uh, ceases to be usable um, because it is it is too close to the water level um, or, or you know, global temperatures mean that things like UK agriculture um, you know, become non-viable. Our thanks to Richard Hughes. So let's dive straight in with Michael Gove. Welcome to mm. you. You've just heard there the official number cruncher say that it might be five or six years before people really start to feel better off again. Do you think that's right? Uh, we don't know. And I think, uh, to be fair to Richard Hughes, he was very clear that uh, uh, forecasting is a very, very difficult exercise. I'm not going to criticise forecasters. I mean, I, I wrote a book called Michael Portillo, The Future of the Right, so I'm not very good at uh, forecasting the future. Um, but I do know that, um, as Richard quite rightly pointed out, we're dealing with the aftershocks of two, you know, uh, uh, significant events. So both the war in Ukraine, first time we've had war on this scale on the continent of Europe mm. since the Second World War, and the COVID pandemic, the, the biggest global health um, you know, pandemic since uh, the end of the First World War, mm -hmm. they have had a huge effect on our economy and on others' economies. But every country has had that, and this country has also had, as you heard Richard say there, a shock to the economy from the disruption of Brexit, which you backed. 
and what the impact of that is for people right now, not forecasting into the future, is a very serious squeeze yes. on living standards. Now, by any measure, notwithstanding the fact that you've had to cope with all sorts of different things, by any measure, the Conservatives have been in charge for 13 years. So is it a failure that our viewers this morning are living through the biggest drop in living standards in, on record? No, and to be fair, uh, both in your question and in what Richard Hughes said, that context was provided. Mm -hmm. And this government, Rishi Sunak, has ensured that we've taken action to help people with the cost of living. So uh, the steps that were taken, both in the recent budget, but even before that, uh, have helped people through this difficult time. So we have a windfall tax on oil and gas companies. Uh, so that some Which of the- fought against to begin with and then took the policy from the Labour Party. Not quite, because the, the Labour approach would have been different from us. But anyway, he took the firm but fair step of making sure that we would uh, ensure that companies, which were benefiting actually as a result of the conflict, uh, paid their fair share to help people with their energy bills and people's energy bills are broadly half what they would otherwise have been as a result of what Rishi and Jeremy have done. But those aren't the only steps that we've taken. We've also taken the, you know, for me, difficult and unpalatable decision mm -hmm. to increase taxation on other businesses in order to help people through these difficult times as well. But Richard Hughes has said very plainly to us we are poorer, we are a poorer country. So if we're having a really honest conversation about this with our audience this morning, do you accept that we are a poorer country than we were going to be? Well, everyone I think accepts, yes, that uh, if we hadn't had um, uh, the war, the impact that it's had, as we've heard, on fossil fuel prices and on, um, uh, on other uh, supplies as well, including food, um, if we hadn't had the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. then, uh, we would have been in a position where our growth rate was significantly higher. But is that also a reflection on the government? I mean, you say there that the government has spent billions trying to yeah. help people. That is true. But they have spent billions on an energy policy, for example, that has helped every single household in the land. Perhaps that support might have been better targeted at the people who really need it. There are four million children mm. living in poverty, more than two million people using food banks. For the first time, we've had those official figures. Surely, Michael Gove, you must accept that the government has some responsibility for that and there is an element of failure in allowing people in this country to live in that way. Well, we can always do better, yes. And, and one of the things that we're seeking to do is to make sure both that we can grow the economy overall and that we can help the most vulnerable. So in Jeremy Hunt's budget, um, we took steps to help people uh, who were not working to work. So mm -hmm. we um, took steps to uh, expand the labour market, as the economists would call it, but basically mm -hmm to help families. So um, we're doing more on childcare mm -hmm. in order to make it easier for both parents uh, uh, to work or either parent to work. Um, we're taking steps to change the pension rules mm -hmm. so that more people who've been retiring early, particularly those in the NHS... The very, very wealthy will be able well, to have a it, tax break it, from the government. That's not helps, about helping people at the bottom. It helps the economy grow and it helps cut uh, waiting lists, which is an absolutely critical thing. But more broadly, mm -hmm. Um, what we're also doing is making sure that we target support on the poorest to help them through this cost of living uh, crisis. When it comes to Everything from uh, additional support for mm -hmm. the very poorest through mm -hmm. things like the people premium but in the one school. One of the things that was not in the budget, yeah. though, yes. was more support for people with housing costs. Now, this is your yes. brief. Yes. And I want to ask you specifically, you know, we heard one of our contributors in this studio last week say there was nothing in the budget on housing. And we've heard this week from BBC viewers and also from the official statistics that rents are going up yes. very significantly. We've heard anecdotal evidence of rents sometimes going up by 20, 25, even 30 percent. Is it acceptable for landlords to be putting rent up above inflation? Uh, most circumstances, no. And what are you going to do about landlords who are doing that? Well, we're bringing forward reforms um, a little bit later this year, in just a couple of months' time, actually, uh, to look at how the private rented sector can be better regulated. We're not talking about rent freezes or rent caps, but we are talking about protection for tenants. At the moment, there is a situation where tenants can be uh, evicted without any fault on their part, and some, a tiny minority, of unscrupulous landlords are using the threat of eviction in order to jack up rents and to victimise tenants. Now, it's, it's important that we recognise, mm. as your question does, that a healthy private rented sector is absolutely vital to making sure that people have the right home at the right place at the right time, but we do need to make sure that we protect tenants from um, unscrupulous landlords, even as we also give landlords the power to get rid of anti-social tenants as well. And do you think, just briefly, that there are landlords, some of them right now, 
who are profiteering, who are using the context of what's going on to make profit at the expense of their tenants. In every market, there will always be actors who will attempt to exploit circumstances in their interests, so, not yes. in the public interest, yes. Now, tomorrow, the government is going to make some announcements on antisocial behaviour. The Prime Minister will be at an event announcing things, I believe. It might feel familiar to viewers to hear a Prime Minister say, aha, I'm going to crack down on offenders, I'm going to crack down on what they might say are jobs in our city centres. And it feels familiar because it is familiar, because Boris Johnson announced this kind of thing. Dominic Raab went and posed with people with high-vis vests on. David Cameron announced this sort of thing. Even Tony Blair back in the day promised that he would be marching jobs, as he called it, to cash points to take money out to pay their fines immediately. This is a rebranding exercise, isn't it, more no, than anything else? It's a comprehensive plan which will both see um, more uniformed officers in hotspot areas where crime is a particular problem and antisocial behaviour blights lives, and faster uh, uh, justice, which will see people who've been responsible for damaging the area in which they live uh, repair uh, the fabric, the social, the civic fabric of the communities that they've undermined. And it will also see investment in making sure that there are alternative activities for young people and that we divert people away from antisocial behaviour before it occurs. And yes or no, will there be extra money to do this? Or yes, £160 million. Pounds. Well, that's not a huge amount of money if you look at how pressed some of the services are. Now, antisocial behaviour is serious when it happens to people, but if you look at the latest crime survey for England and Wales, the level of antisocial behaviour is actually going down, while at the same time, we hear all the time about record weights for prosecutions terrible rates of prosecutions for very serious crimes like rape and violent crime. Is this really the best use of government money and really the right priority to have when serious crimes many people in this country would feel right now are going unpunished? Well, I, I think you, you, you have to do both. You have to walk and chew gum. So if you were to go to Wildenhall or um, uh, any of the communities that Andy serves in the West Midlands and say to them, look, antisocial behaviour, not much of a problem, is it? I think you get a pretty tart response. Uh, it is the case that there are uh, communities across this country where people feel uh, the, the high street uh, has been uh, damaged because of the behaviour of thugs and yobs. They feel that they can't walk at night, women and girls in particular, in public spaces because of intimidatory behaviour. We do need to deal with that. Um, it, it is the case that if you want investment in those areas, mm -hmm. then uh, you need to make sure that the pride that people feel in their communities is reflected in an orderly public space, and that means that you need to deal with antisocial behaviour. You are right, however, that we also need to do more in order to ensure the faster prosecution of very serious crimes. And again, the work that Rishi and Dominic Raab have undertaken has seen a significant increase in the number of people uh, 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 being prosecuted and the faster prosecution from for very, rape very, and serious very, very sexual levels offences. That have, that have caused uh, a of lot course. of distress and, and, to victims. Uh, well, uh, it, it is the case that uh, the period of time mm -hmm. between uh, someone reporting an offence and uh, the eventual sentence being passed for rape and serious sexual offences was far too long. Mm -hmm. It was um, uh, a failure of the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. But it is an issue that Dominic Raab has addressed and it requires everyone from uh, the police who are responsible obviously through to the crime prosecution service and the courts working better together one of the problems that we've mm -hmm. had in our criminal justice system is that each of them have operated uh, in silos we haven't had a system one of the things about our anti-social behavior mm -hmm. action plan mm -hmm. is that it is an example of systems thinking because it brings together police local government uh, and uh, the justice system. And it will be interesting to see the plans in full uh, tomorrow, but part of that we understand is that laughing gas, yes. which some people use to give them a high, is set to be banned. Yes. Now, is that true? And why are you doing that when the independent panel that looks at these things on behalf of the government says it's disproportionate to ban it? Well, uh, we're doing it because if you walk through any urban park, you will see these little silver canisters, which are the evidence of people regarding public spaces as arenas for drug taking. That is unacceptable. Um, people should uh, feel that those spaces are being looked after in a way which means that they are safe for children, that they are not the recourse for people who want to engage in this sort of antisocial behaviour. Uh, this drug is one that can have an intoxicating and potentially damaging effect on uh, young brains and young nervous systems. So we need to stop it. The advisory committee offers advice, mm -hmm. but ministers ultimately decide. And uh, Rishi Sunak and the Home Secretary have been clear, and I agree with them, mm -hmm. that we need to draw a line. You know, there the, 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 the tends to be 
this approach that, oh, it's only minor or, you know, uh, let people let off steam. No, these are public spaces that should be safe and orderly. Once you begin mm -hmm. to retreat from these public spaces, once you say anything goes, mm -hmm. then as we know, what uh, uh, appear to be small infringements mm -hmm. turn into a greater degree of lawlessness. There's a theory, the so-called broken windows theory, that mm -hmm. describes this behavior. If you tolerate low-level disorder, then you lose the attractiveness and security that everyone has a right to expect in public spaces. OK, well, the Prime Minister will give more detail on all of that tomorrow. Um, but I just want to ask you about some, some big characters and some big changes that are happening in the political landscape at the mm. moment. Um, Nicola Sturgeon's last morning in oh, the yes. office is tomorrow. What do you think her biggest achievement is? Um, I don't want to say anything uh, uh, bad or... Um, what's the word, uh, negative about Nicola Sturgeon, um, because I think that she is a dedicated public servant and uh, she's devoted uh, her life to public service. And uh, as First Minister of Scotland, uh, I worked with her during the pandemic. Uh, I know that she was committed to coming to the right conclusions in the interests of the people of Scotland. I fundamentally disagree with her on many things, but I wish her well. Now, some other people that you have worked with and you know well are Matt Hancock and Kwasi Kwarteng. Now, they've both been filmed undercover in a sting by the uh, campaigning organisation led by Donkeys and shown to have taken a meeting about a job that would have been a fake job advising a company in South Korea. Um, and they seem to have been asking for rather a lot of money. Do you think that Matt Hancock and Kwasi Kwarteng are worth £10,000 a day? Well, again, uh, the, the, the market, as it were, uh, decides many of these things, but the most, important, th the most important thing is uh, not these negotiations, the most important thing is what every member of parliament does for their constituents. So you can have people mm -hmm. who are both members of parliament but also do other work. So Maria Caulfield, my colleague, is a nurse alongside being but a health minister. My question is that whether or not you think they're worth £10,000 a day. As a former cabinet minister and somebody like Kwasi Kwarteng, who essentially had to resign because everything blew up on his watch, are they worth £10,000 a day? They've not broken any rules, well, but is conceptually, are they worth £10,000 a day in your view? I'm not a commentator. I don't pass judgment on other members of parliament. Uh, there are rules that govern what members of parliament should do and what they should declare. But the jury here is the constituency. So mm -hmm. it will be the case, come a general election, if Matt and Kwasi choose to stand again, that their constituents will decide. Um, I think they're both talented people with mm -hmm. a lot to offer in the future, but mm -hmm. ultimately they will have to answer for the decisions that they've taken. OK, somebody who still has a constituency is Liz Truss. Yes or no, should she be able to send her friends to the House of Lords? Uh, I think that is a matter for the Prime Minister. I, I, I you don't think I should speculate on uh, what has in itself been speculation about honours. As I say, um, you know, my job is to uh, help to ensure that we support local government in its job of delivery. Okay. There are people who are smarter, wittier and uh, more perceptive who can offer commentary on other parts I'm not sure that you publics. don't really have a view on that, Michael Gove, but you're being very diplomatic. Um, lastly, I want to show you and the audience something that happened this week. Let's have a show of hands, shall we? Who, well, who believes Boris Johnson was telling the truth yesterday? <laughs> wow. Okay. Wow. <laughs> now, that was my colleague Fiona Bruce asking a yes. question time audience if any of them believed Boris Johnson when he was being questioned by MPs this week about what happened in Partygate. I just want to check with our panel. Did any of you believe Boris Johnson? Stick your hand up if you thought he was telling the truth. I'll put it half up and you can half explain Half up from why. Andy Street. OK, well, maybe ask him to play. Um, what about you, Michael Gove? Did you believe what Boris Johnson said to MPs this week? Yes, I did. How, do you think he's always told the truth? Uh, I think that uh, all of us will at some point have told a white lie or an untruth. But I think the fundamental thing here, and again, you know, the Privileges Committee will make up its own mind. It's looked at all of the evidence. But um, what was Boris's argument? He was working incredibly hard uh, every hour that the Lord sent in order to try to do the right thing. He believed that uh, saying thank you to people who were leaving in the uh, cramped and confined circumstances of 10 Downing Street was part of that job. Did he attend those events in a spirit of self-indulgence? No, he did so in order to show uh, his gratitude to those who were working with him. Um, it will be for the Privileges Committee to decide for um, members of parliament to decide.
but I worked with Boris during that mm -hmm. period, and I am inclined to give him not just the benefit of the doubt, but to believe that when he places his hand on his heart and he says he did not think that he was breaking the rules, I do believe him. OK, Michael Gove, thank you very much for coming in and taking questions on such a range of subjects. Now then, let's talk about that interview and what else is making the news today with our panel. Now, Andy Street, I must ask you, you put your hand half up when we asked you three if you believe Boris Johnson this yeah. week. Can you explain it to the other two why and you gave him half the benefit of the doubt? It picks up exactly what Michael was saying. The critical word in that uh, discussion was willfully. And I actually know, we all know, that what was done was wrong. But the question was, was it being done in an absolute planful way to deceive? And I do not believe that it was. Andy, why didn't you believe Boris Johnson? Well, um, I mean, on this one, uh, it is a question of judgment, and I accept the willful uh, point. Uh, but the time and a place in public service just to come clean and say mistakes were made, it felt here that mistakes were made. OK, right, let's get on to other subjects and other things that Michael Gove was talking about with the economy. So when you heard Michael Gove trying to explain why the UK is in a fix, mm. to what extent has the situation we've been in down to this government and to what extent to you as an economist is it actually down to things that were beyond their control? How would you measure out? Well, the lion's share has been two horrible shocks first COVID and the cost of living uh, crisis, that has done the lion's share of the damage to our prospects as a country, to the incomes of, uh, of households. It's been a huge effect. You know, incomes, as, as Richard said on the, on the mm -hmm. video, six, seven, eight percent lower than pre-pandemic. For poorer households, even more than that. We are materially poorer as a country and as people as a result of those two shocks. But what about the politicians' role in all of this, though? I mean, because it is at the end of the day, when it comes to the ballot box, people want to know, are the politicians being honest with them about whose fault things were? Mm. And also how credible what they're offering to fix it is. Yeah. Well, on the fixing part, absolutely there's a role for, for public policy, through budgets and other stuff, to try and repair the damage done to people's incomes as quickly as possible. As Richard said, right now, it's a pretty leisurely path back to restoring pre-pandemic levels of income, five years plus. Is there a case for pressing the accelerator to speed that recovery of income? Yes, I think there is. Some of that was in the budget. More is needed, I would say. And Christiana, when you look at the UK, I know you look at all sorts of countries around the world, but you've been here this week and you talk powerfully about meeting mums who can't make ends meet. How do you assess how the government has been coping here? Well, I'm afraid that the UK is not doing as well as it could and should. Richard was very clear about the long-term impacts of runaway climate change on this country. Mm. And that is only partial of the impacts that we're going to have across the world. And all of this is actually going to be implicating all of us. So when we think cost of living, we have to think cost of living equals burning of fossil fuels. Let's please make that connection because otherwise we are looking at factors that yes, impact, but fundamentally the trend that we're looking at is a very dire trend unless we're acting on climate change. And in a couple of minutes, I'm going to ask you for some of the solutions that they might be there. But Andy, I also want to ask you a question about the banks and are they safe? So for a few weeks in a row, there's been a bit of a wobble around one bank. We talked about SVB in the studio a couple of weeks ago, Silicon Valley Bank. That was bought by another bank, so that was made safe, if you like. But then we see what's happened with Credit Suisse. Huge institution, that's all kind of gone wrong. Deutsche Bank now, big, powerful German bank. Are they really safe? Well, we've had a huge shock in financial markets over the last 12 months. Interest rates have risen from almost nothing up to 4 or 5% globally. That will crystallise losses, significant losses. And SVB and Credit Suisse, uh, others prospectively, are some of the casualties of that. So there could be more casualties? There, of course, could be more casualties. I suspect many more of them will lie beyond these shores, Laura. Perhaps in the US, they're regional banks. Will this, though, be the sort of collapse of confidence 
collapse of credit we saw back 15 years ago. I think not, actually. Our banks are stronger. And Andy, uh, Andy other Andy, I can see you nodding your head yeah. there. So now you were running John Lewis during the last big economic crash that we had, the financial crisis. When you look around businesses in the West Midlands, you said before there was exciting growth yeah. in some new areas. But what's the sort of overall sentiment? You know, what's the standard feeling when they know that consumers have got less to spend? Well, it's very interesting because businesses, of course, are always thinking about the future. And data we've just had is future business sentiment, to answer your question head on, is actually remarkably positive. Better in the West Midlands than elsewhere in the country, interestingly. And just to come to the point you were teasing out with Andy, I don't hear from businesses about the credit crunch, literally the shortage of borrowing lines. Actually, we hear that all of our clearing banks are making more money available for SMEs and we're trying to bring in different forms of lending as well. So that doesn't appear to be the big challenge at the moment. There are other challenges also to some big brands. And I've got to ask you about this as the former boss of John Lewis. There's been yeah. speculation that Sharon White, who's been in this studio, the boss of John Lewis now, might actually be going to go away from the model where the staff members are a partner and it runs in a sort of more, eth they would say they run ethically compared to other big retailers. What do you think about changing well, the model? As you know, it's my old life. It's many years since I left and I don't tend to comment on it publicly, but I will give you my sort of reaction, which is, it would be a tragedy if that occurred, because I think John Lewis goes a bit beyond a shop. You know, you can buy the same television in other places is the truth, but John Lewis was about actually a way of doing business, actually showing the market there was a better way almost. And in fact, that's now potentially, if you believe what it says in the press, under threat. So I would urge the leadership of John Lewis to think about what's really at the heart of it, what makes it special, and hold on to that. But if it's losing money, yep. can it keep going in so the you same have, way? So you have to address the underlying point. And this was ever the case in the John Lewis model over 150 years. If you can't go to the equity markets, you have to either trade your way through it, and of course some of the best retailers at the moment, Next, Primark, Selfridges, all you know, wonderfully successful businesses at the moment are proving that physical retail can still do that. And that's really the challenge to John Lewis and Waitrose. OK, well, maybe Sharon White was watching. I don't know, but I'm sure she'll hear it loud and clear, even if she's not watching right now. Now, Christiana, we've promised people some solutions for what you've talked about very clearly is the risk, not just to the economy, but to, to everything from climate change. Now, you're chair of the Earthshot Prize, the Prince and Princesses of Wales casting around the globe for good solutions. Now, I understand, we see some beautiful pictures here of coral reefs, that actually some clever people have actually come up with a way of growing the coral, saving the coral, which its reduction we know is an environmental threat. Tell us about that. Well, first let's understand why it's really important. Coral reefs are actually represent the livelihood of one billion people around the world. They're also the home of one quarter of all marine life. So they're basically the canary in the oceans. We have lost 50% of coral reefs already, and we stand uh, the danger of losing up to 90% over the next 30 years. So we have to not just save what we have, but actually restore them so that we can grow. And we have in, uh, in the Earthshot Prize a fantastic startup in the Bahamas, Coral Vita, who together with many other very, very similar companies and NGOs are developing technologies to grow corals outside of the oceans and then replant them inside the oceans to restore that very important and basic and ecosystem. And see them, they're meeting um, Prince William and uh, Princess Catherine there at the, where they're trying to do it. But when it comes to the really big challenges, of course, and you've mentioned it yourself today, fossil fuels and our addiction to the combustion engine. Indeed. So what's the solution to that? Well, obviously, the solution on the energy side is to move over to renewable energy. And the good news there is that we are definitely all very much on the cusp of an exponential shift, both in renewable energy generation, but more importantly, in what that does, that renewable energy generation capacity that is growing very, very quickly, is it allows for many other sectors to also shift. And hydrogen, a lot of Westminster politicians exactly. sometimes talk about the so possibility of that. So if you have enough renewable energy, then you can use renewable energy to produce green hydrogen. Green hydrogen, very important. Mm -hmm. And that green hydrogen can be used to produce ammonia, to produce methane, which means we can actually clean industry, steel, cement, shipping, aviation, 
all of the things that we cannot electrify. Forgive cleanly. me for being skeptical, though. I have heard quite a lot of politicians in this country talk for quite a long time about the potential of hydrogen, and it doesn't ever quite seem to come to pass. But I think we really are there now. Let's remember that change takes longer than you think, and then it happens faster than you ever thought possible. That is true of hydrogen. Christiana, Andy, thanks so much. Andy? Christiana, isn't it, that we are decarbonising our economy. If I just look across the West Midlands, a transport system, we're building electric vehicles now like never before. The government's put the change in the, to 2030 for the rules. We're even beginning to retrofit homes to make those more efficient, and we're thinking about decarbonising manufacturing production. So I know it's not fast enough, but I do genuinely believe Absolutely. we've passed an inflection point. Yes. And Andy, as yes. the elected politician on our panel, what yeah. did you think when you saw the led by donkeys on Matt Hancock, Quasi Kwarteng and some other Conservative politicians. We can see them there. They haven't done anything wrong or broken it's, any rules, well, but red faces, surely. Red faces, but the clues in how you describe it, it's a sting. I mean, that's, that's the other thing you've got to think. Is that the right way of going about things? I personally believe I've never taken a second job in this role. I actually believe the first priority comes to your constituents. It's a full-time so job. So should MPs not take second jobs I didn't then? say never, but you've got to be very, very selective. Some actually, and Michael talked about a few examples, mm -hmm. add to it. But the general view of looking for a selection of non-executives, I don't agree with that. Okay, all three of you, thank you very much for now. What an interesting conversation that was. And we've heard what the panel think. We want to know what you think too. You know we always like to hear from you. You can send us an email, koonsberg at bbc.co.uk or on social media, we're at BBC Laura K. Maybe it would be interesting to hear how you've had to cut back or not. Maybe you're already feeling better off or maybe you are really feeling the pinch. So let us know or you can follow the conversation on the BBC webpage as ever. Now, as you know, we will keep talking about what's going on in Ukraine in this studio. That conflict has shown us there are all sorts of ways of being brave. Remember this journalist, Marina of Zianikova? She was at work at her TV station one day last year when she decided she couldn't take it anymore. Her sign reads, stop the war. They are lying to you here. Now that decision to burst into a live studio made her a target, a danger to Putin, and she decided to flee, evading capture, running away from border guards, and even one of her escape vehicles got stuck in the mud. She is now safe in Paris, from where she explained to us why she took the decision that changed her life for good. I had this mixed emotions because before this protest, a lot of factors came together. Well, for a long time, I realized that the Russian TV became like a gigantic brainwashing machine. Well, secondly, I have Ukrainian roots. My father is from Ukraine. At that point, it was like this huge emotional outburst. But I didn't really care what would happen to me later. How did you feel in those moments? Well, first of all, um, I was like 90 percent sure that I won't be able to get through the security to the studio um, because of all these issues with security. And so I was thinking um, I won't be able to protest, but even if I were, it probably be um, a 10 year prison sentence for anti-war protests. And you had worked, though, at that channel for nearly 20 years. Why had you not spoken up before? I did shut my eyes to it. I realized that um, under the circumstances when the Russia's all independent media was destroyed, I won't be able to secure any other employment on TV. I prefer to bury my head in the sand, like a lot of other Russian people, but the war became a point of no return for me. It did, though, of course, mean that you had to leave the country. How did you escape? Well, at that point, I didn't have a Schengen visa and my children's passports expired, so I didn't plan to immigrate um, to begin with. Well, a year later, I was arrested. And in the end, my solicitor did find a way for me to leave Russia. Well, obviously, I can't give you details. Well, the only thing I can say is that it was overnight from Friday to Saturday. We changed about seven cars. The last car was stuck in the mud. It was 
not going according to the plan. Um, I was almost screaming, thinking and saying, it's better for me to go back to Russia, go to prison. But my daughter was saying, get up, let's go, we have to cross the border. And how do you feel now about your country? Do you feel ashamed of what's happening in Russia? Yes, uh, I'm really ashamed that uh, this war started because when I was working with International Channel, a lot of my friends from abroad was texting me, asking what is going on, has Putin gone mad? And I thought, yeah, really, uh, he went mad. And how widely held do you think your views are inside Russia? And are people just frightened to speak up? Well, you know, this propaganda is made on a very high level, as it showed recently um, what effect it has. But also I wanted to say that uh, these people who are working in the main media channels, they don't really believe it. Uh, they have similar views to me, and also you can say that uh, people who are pro-Putin, who are convinced in him, it's no more than 10 or 20 percent. President Putin has now been handed an arrest warrant by the International Criminal Court. Do you think that might help bring this conflict to a conclusion? Or, or actually, might that even be a badge of honour for him, another symbol that he could use to say that the West is unfairly trying to target him? I think this is the first signal that the Russian elite should take notice of and perhaps some kind of resistance will start within the Russian elite and they might plot against him. Uh, at least uh, this some kind of hope for me. Shortly after you left, you said that your son had told you that your decision to protest like that had ruined the life of the family. Does he still feel that or do you feel now you have more understanding or does he understand the personal decision you took? My son still called me a traitor, that I betrayed our family, I betrayed our country. I can say that uh, for a lot, for millions of families, it's the same situation, war ruins a lot of families. And this is a real catastrophe because uh, Russians are being destroyed by Putin, not only physically by him sending them to war, but also on a psychological level. Because now in Russia, it's an incredible situation. Uh, Russia now deep in depression. There is an apathy everywhere and millions of people just don't know what the future holds. And just lastly, Marina, do you feel it will ever be safe for you to go home? I can't go back now, but I do see my future with Russia. My son is there, my family is there, my mom, and they don't want to leave the country. So for me, I'm not indifferent to the future of this country, and I will fight for the future, even being outside of Russia. Marina, we hope one day you'll be able to make that return. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. Thank you. Now, it's no secret that the BBC has had a tricky few weeks, surely not in this studio, but there have been accusations of bias flying around from all sides, not least because of the row over Gary Lineker's exploits on social media and the position of the BBC chairman and friend of Boris Johnson, Richard Sharp. Labour's Lucy Powell, who looks after culture and media for the party, reckons it's time for a proper conversation about how the organisation is run. She's announcing an independent review into the BBC and she joins us from, where else, but the BBC in Salford. Um, Lucy, good morning to you. What is wrong that you want to put right? Well, thank you, uh, Laura. Well, as the Labour Party, we support the BBC as a universal, publicly funded, public service broadcast broadcaster that curates our national conversation, that educates our children, that provides trusted local news and news around the world and brings us together with some of its fantastic uh, content. But the BBC faces some serious headwinds coming up the track. Its future is constantly under attack, constantly being questioned, how it's funded in the future, constantly 
uh, questioned and under attack. Uh, we've seen questions around the independence and the impartiality of the BBC. And in the streaming and platform and social media age, I think we have to look uh, deeply and carefully about what the future is of an organisation like the BBC in the digital and streaming age. And given that the charter renewal process will be well underway by the time of the next uh, general election, I think now is the time for us to really uh, put together a very serious uh, panel of people that I've uh, put together to uh, advise and make recommendations to the Labour Party about how the BBC can not just survive into the next uh, few decades, but can really thrive in the next few decades because that's what we want to see. So I'm really pleased that people like James Pennell, Jim Sarpong, Steve Morrison and Lou Cordwell are going to be uh, really spending some serious time thinking about these issues and, and making some recommendations. And you've mentioned lots of issues there. You've mentioned independence, you've mentioned funding. So let's look at those two in particular. So Labour has raised concerns that with a Conservative backing chair of the BBC, the organisation finds it hard to be properly independent. Would you commit to Labour never appointing somebody to a senior position at the BBC with links to the party? Well, <clears throat> that, this is something that obviously the panel... Uh, we'll, we'll look at and make some recommendations about. But, but what's I, your I, view? That's I, a political I, decision. I, yeah, I personally don't want to... I don't think we should be precluding people from taking up these positions who have previously been involved uh, in politics. But I think what we absolutely have to look at is making sure that the process behind that is fully transparent, completely uh, robust, and that the very best people for the job uh, are appointed. So that you can't have these questions that we've had over this uh, particular appointment process that's now under investigation, under investigation because I asked for that investigation, but also uh, other board members and the way in which they're uh, appointed uh, as well. But so if we will be looking at these issues. Could be in senior positions at the BBC, wouldn't you then just do the same that you've accused the Conservatives of, basically appointing their cronies? Well, no, um, and that's what we want to, to restore some credibility and confidence uh, in this process. And yes, of course, there were people in the past that have been uh, shared the, the Labour Party's uh, views and, and values uh, in terms of their appointment, who then uh, very quickly and rightly so <clears throat> became absolutely independent and impartial so so much so that you know there were times in the past where where they were at great conflict with the with the last uh, labor labor government so that's what we need to see but we do need to make sure that the whole process is fully robust and transparent which it hasn't been uh, in the in this case you know we saw a circumstance where the prime minister made it very clear who he wanted to appoint right from the outset putting off uh, other people from applying. We then had a, a, a so-called independent panel, which wasn't independent at all, that really just had to assess whether the candidates passed a very minimum bar of appointability, and then the Prime Minister appointed who he wanted uh, anyway. Well, that and then is it being out, investigated and at then the it moment. Turned, well, what's but being but investigated is being is investigated at the closures. moment, Lucy Powell. But I'm interested, you, you clearly believe that credibility needs to be restored to this system. Wouldn't the easiest way of restoring credibility just to say, OK, no political links. If Labour was in charge, you would not appoint anybody with any political links. Then you could restore credibility, if that's your case. Well, look, that's something we, we will look at, but I do think that would narrow the field significantly because, of course, people uh, later in their career, which is often, uh, you know, we want experienced people, people who've worked across a whole range of, of positions in, in broadcasting and in industry and civil society coming forward for these roles, people have expressed uh, political opinions, people have got uh, political views and so on uh, in, in their past. So I don't want to narrow the field so much that you're only then choosing from people who've never expressed an opinion ever before in their entire entire life. But what I do want to do is restore uh, some credibility, independence and transparency uh, to that process. Right, you, so you and, talked about funding, that's one of the other big mm -hmm. challenges, and there's often political argument about the licence fee. Is it possible that Labour would keep the licence fee past 2027? It's very possible. Um, you know, we believe very strongly in a universally publicly funded BBC. So that is where everybody uh, contributes and everybody uh, has access to the, to the BBC because it's that model that pays for all the things that otherwise wouldn't exist because there's 
uh, there's not a competitive market for it, whether that's BBC Bite Size and all the education that was provided during COVID, whether that is world leading uh, news journalism covering issues like Ukraine or uh, issues all around the world and local uh, news that, that many uh, other players have, have left the space from uh, entirely, or whether that's ensuring that we've got brilliant independent British film and brilliant uh, British uh, content for British audiences. You know, these things might not happen without that kind of uh, funding model. But I do think it's important that we closely scrutinise and really reset and rebuild a consensus around some of these issues because this also is one of the reasons why I think the BBC has, has not felt that it could be as, as independent and as punchy as it, as it might want to be because okay. there are just constant questions about defunding it and getting rid of uh, its funding altogether. And okay, I, well, I don't it will think be it interesting. Would in that. It'll be interesting to hear what your review um, comes up with in the next few months. Um, I want to just finally ask you about another issue. So sure. you're in charge of culture and media for the Labour Party, but also sports. Um, now, this week we saw the World Athletics Federation make a decision, controversial to many people, um, called for by many others. They made a decision to ban trans women from comp competing in women's events. Should other sports follow that example? Well, other sports have been following uh, that example. So they and should? I think, I think, look, it is for sporting uh, governing bodies to look at these issues, and it is particular to different uh, sports. And I think, for me, the principles are absolutely inclusion, where inclusion can be achieved uh, fairly, uh, and with fair competition and not where that puts uh, safety issues uh, at risk. So certainly some sports like athletics, uh, rugby, cycling and so on, you can't achieve inclusion with fair competition and meeting those safety barriers. But there are other sports, equestrian or snooker or darts and other sports like that where you can achieve uh, inclusion with, without putting those other things at risk. So, so that's why uh, sports governing bodies should look at these issues themselves uh, closely. But, you know, and they're difficult issues to resolve, but I support the, the action that, that World Athletics has taken this week. Okay, Lucy Powell, great to have you on the programme. Thank you very much indeed for joining us from Salford. Thank, Thank you for now. Now it's nearly 10 o'clock. Imagine that. And we started this morning asking a simple question that might have a complicated answer. When is everyone going to start to feel better off? Here's Michael Gove. We're dealing with the aftershocks of two, you know, uh, uh, significant events. So both the war in Ukraine, first time we've had war on this scale on the continent of Europe mm -hmm. since the Second World War, and the COVID pandemic, the, the biggest global health, um, you know, pandemic since uh, the end of the First World War. Mm -hmm. Well, we've talked a lot already to our panel about that issue. So I want to close talking about another big political moment that is about to happen, the departure of Nicola Sturgeon, who's been such a big figure in our politics for a long time. She'll be replaced tomorrow by either Kate Forbes, Ash Regan or Hamza Youssef. We've talked to all of them in the last three weeks. But Andy, you interviewed Nicola Sturgeon at an event in London this week. Do you feel you really got under the skin of why she's leaving? Uh, not entirely. Um... <laughs> Uh, I mean, I will tell on that. Um, what was clear, though, uh, is that on some of the signature issues of the day, climate, inequality, democracy, she has, a more, she has more to say on those things and watch this space on that, I'd say. Ah, well, that's interesting. Maybe potentially, it has been touted many times, a, a job at your former organisation, Christiane, the United Nations. I mean, does she have that kind of presence on the world stage? Could you see her? She does. I think her trajectory uh, and her experience are actually would make her a very strong candidate for many international positions, not just the UN. And we also interviewed her on the podcast, Outrage and Optimism, she already sort of let a little piece uh, there that um, she might be looking at bigger things. Oh, goodness me. Well, Andy, I know you're a conservative politician, but you're also one of those big figures outside Westminster. Do you think that she'll leave a hole, you know, one of those powerful figures outside yeah. Westminster on our sort of national stage? And, you know, these two have both been very flattering, but a lot of people in your party, I think Michael Gove a little bit, have a slightly different view. Well, Michael was fair. He said we disagree politically, but he respects what she's done, it be my view, uh, that what she's done to build the role, build the institution of the Scottish Government, that deserves huge respect. And it's got to be good for Britain is the big point to have lots of people outside London 
building their institutions because Britain will be stronger for that. OK, well, one of them will be with us actually next week, Tracy Braben, the Labour Mayor for West Yorkshire. She'll be here with us in the studio. But all three of you, Christiana Figueres, Andy Haldane and Andy Street. First time we've had two Andys in the studio and very good it was too. And just like that, it is goodbye from me for another week. We've been very un-British this morning. We've talked a lot about money and politicians hope that inflation will drop a lot by the end of this year. But after shocks and pretty awful economic performance, the contest for your vote is likely to centre around who can offer hope for your wallet and a convincing strategy for the country to pay its way. But the man who earns his wages by making the forecasts told me this morning it might be five or six years before people start feeling more prosperous. Gulp. You'll hear more from the Prime Minister on antisocial behaviour tomorrow. And don't forget, there will be plenty of coverage on BBC News of the new First Minister of Scotland tomorrow, whoever that is. Great to have your company as ever, and you can always go to iPlayer for more. Or I will see you here next week. Goodbye. see you. And so it begins. The Earth is a big place, Pip. I will teach you. Teach me what? The wicked ways of this wicked city. Great Expectations starts tonight at nine on BBC One and iPlayer. Now on BBC One, a look at what matters where you live with Amelia Reynolds. It's Politics East. Hello, hope you're not too bleary eyed after the clocks went forward. If you are, we've got plenty to wake you up this morning. We're going to be talking about dentists or the lack of them. Thousands of us in this region are struggling to get appointments. It could also become more difficult to get business support in the future after the government announced plans in last week's budget to abolish local enterprise partnerships. We'll be discussing the fallout and even casting your vote could get harder. The deadline is looming to register your ID ahead of the local elections. My guests this week, Bridget Smith, Liberal Democrat leader of South Cambridgeshire Council and here in the studio with me, Waveney MP, Peter Aldous for the Conservatives and also on the sofa, Mark Jones, uh, the campaign coordinator of Toothless in Suffolk. And that's because this week MPs started an inquiry into dental provision, largely prompted by campaigners like Mark. And I don't need to tell you that this is a really big issue in this region. Andrew's in the newsroom. Uh, bring us up to date with the story, Andrew. Well, Amelia, as you said, this all began with protests in Suffolk where people were finding it almost impossible to get a dentist. That became a national campaign, which then took its message to Parliament last year. And their pressure and that of local MPs has prompted the Health Committee to launch this inquiry. It is a constant issue raised in Parliament at, um, at Health Questions debates in the House and in Westminster Hall. It's very, it's very much a live issue and an issue that touches every single one of us. Well, this map shows the provision of dentists in the region. The lighter the colours, the fewer the number of dentists in an area. For instance, Mid-Suffolk, one dentist per 10,000 people. 1.1 in Breckland and East Cambridgeshire. But even in the best places like Norwich, it's only 2.9 per 10,000. Those giving evidence this week blame staff shortages and a lack of funding. There is only enough NHS dentistry commissioned in this country for 50% of the population. Now, can you imagine if that was general medical practice? There would be rioting. And what we've done over the years is we've, we've plastered over the cracks and dentists in the NHS have kept their practices going. We need a really good strategy for getting dentists over here, and that includes growing our own, but that will take six years, seven years. We can keep the door open to our EU colleagues because we know that they've been really helpful in the past for us. 
The main problem is the NHS contract. Dentists have been paid the same per patient, whether they did one filling or three fillings, so they were losing money if they did more complex work. In November, the government made some tweaks to the contract to provide fairer payments to the dentists, and the Prime Minister claims it's working. We're investing £3 billion in NHS dentistry, and because of the reforms to the contract, there will be about 10% more activity this year above contracted levels. There are 500 more dentists in the NHS today, but also, I think, almost a 45% increase in the amount of dental care being provided to children. The current changes, although welcome, just do not go far enough. None of these changes have new investment attached. So, in essence, what we're doing at the moment is rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic while the service slowly slips into the sea. Andrew, we've just had so many shocking stories this week, haven't we? I mean, children as old as six not knowing what a toothbrush is and...